All right, good evening. We are getting into the Eighth Commandment tonight. Uh, let's start things off by reading it out loud together. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, or give him a bad name, but defend him, speak well of him, and take his words and actions in the kindest possible way. <clears throat> So it starts off with, you shall not bear false witness or false testimony. Uh, we should really define our terms there. What does false testimony mean? Well, false testimony really is all talk. And it can even be factually true words that is designed to hurt a person's reputation and give them a bad name. So words like deceptive, unfaithful, and treacherous would also work for that. Um, you know, when, when we say false testimony, usually when we hear the word false, we think the opposite of true. But false can also have that idea of a malicious, hurtful intent. And that is what is being spoken of here. So it's more than just make sure that what you say about others is true. Because I could tell the truth about Brody, but the truth might theoretically hurt him in his reputation, right? Uh, if he's done anything embarrassing. So uh, that, that's what the, the, the Eighth Commandment really then is about. And what's interesting, when, I, when we got to the Fourth Commandment, we started looking at the second table of God's law, uh, dealing with our relations with our neighbors. I mentioned that there is some sort of hierarchical order to the, the commandments, you know, honor your father and mother. Uh, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, do not steal. And now this one, the Eighth Commandment, uh, because of when you take them to their extremes, the damage that they can cause in this world when you break them. But what's interesting is in many respects, the Eighth Commandment is much more involved in our daily human relationships than a lot of, than, than pretty much any of the other commandments. Because, uh, for example, you know, using Brody again, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm not really going to be tempted to steal anything from him, unless, you know, I'm some sort of kleptomaniac, uh, meaning that a person who loves to steal things. Uh, unless if I'm tempted by that, I'm, I'm probably not going to be thinking, you know what, I'm going to be taking... Whatever it is from Brody. That is a pretty nice Jackrabbits hoodie, though. i got to say. I do like it. <clears throat> but you can have it. <laughs> However, the Eighth Commandment, dealing with human relationships, how we talk to one another, what we say to one another, and about one another, that is what the Eighth Commandment is getting at. Uh, to start things off with... Part 1, what is God protecting in the 8th commandment? I'd actually want you to open your Bibles to the first passage there, 2 Peter 15, verses 1 through 6. We will be looking occasionally at 2 Peter. Might as well take it, right? Yeah. <coughs> uh, second, did I say 2 Peter? I meant 2 Samuel. We'll be looking at 2 Samuel. There will be another Bible passage later on tonight that we'll look at. Graham is just shooting arrows in the dark. He has no idea where 2 Samuel is. That's why we use the index at the beginning. So 2 Samuel, oh, 15. Perfect, one page off. Graham, would you mind reading the first six verses? <clears throat> the name that you're going to be curious about possibly is Absalom. So, verse 1, right there. After this, Absalom acquired for himself a chariot, horses, and 50 men to run in front of him. Absalom would get up early and stand beside the road of the gatehouse. Absalom would call out to every man for a legal issue to bring before the king for judgment. He would say, what city are you from? The person would say, your servant is from such and such of the tribes of Israel. Israel. Absalom would say to him, the claims are good and valid, but there is one, there is no one from the king to listen to. 
Then Absalom would say, I wish someone would make me a judge in the land. Then everyone who has a legal issue or needs judgment could come to me, and I would give them justice. Whenever someone approached to bow down to him, he would reach out and take hold of him and kiss him. Absalom acted this way to everyone of Israel who came to the king for judgment. In this way, Absalom sold the hearts of the men of Israel. All right. How, how did Absalom, or what did Absalom do to steal the hearts of the people away from his father, King David? What was he doing? <clears throat> Jalen, what was Absalom, David's uh, son, doing to steal the loyalty of the people away from him? Did you catch that as you were following along? No? How about you, Paige? No? Nobody? I'm not asking you, don't worry. You're, you're, you're safe tonight. Unless you raise your hand. Jenica, what was Absalom doing? Oh boy, been a struggle tonight. Jada! He was trying to win them over. In what way? What was he doing? You're right. Aaliyah, maybe? Um, he was like, whoever had a legal issue, they, he would have them come to him. And like... All right, and what did he say? You've got a legal issue, you got a, you got a case, and basically what was he saying? What's that? <clears throat> Not quite bribe, but it was kind of like that. It was some sort of enticement, right? Um, it, what it was was this. He was... He's basically acting like a politician, right? You see this whenever there's a presidential campaign. You're going to see it right now. You know, you got, uh, at this point in time, Joe Biden in office, and he looks like he's going to be running again for president. Um, and, well, all signs at this point in time are pointing to Donald Trump being the Republican nominee. That's what it's looking like it's coming toward. And each, what is each guy going to be doing? during the course of their campaign. <clears throat> right, right. And one of the things that they'll do, uh, and, and I want to focus more on Trump at this point, not getting into the politics of it, I'm not going to do that, but he's going to make claims. He's going to make promises of, if I am president, I am going to do this. And that's essentially what... Uh, part of what Absalom was doing. He's saying, you know what? If I were a judge or I were a king, I would be listening to your case. And so now, you know, he's making a promise, but at the same time, there's also a little bit of, a, uh, of something that he's implying, that David doesn't care for you. My dad isn't working for you, but if I were a judge, I would work for you. Be careful of politicians, because a lot of times, you know, they're going to make those promises, but how often are they serious about keeping them? They're not. Don't get caught up with politics, Republican or Democrat, in that regard, because a lot of them are going to make promises that they, they have no intentions to keep. I mean, for years, and here's, here's an example, the Republicans were always talking about, oh, we've got to balance the budget, we're, we're spending too much as a country, we're in a huge deficit, and are we? Absolutely. Well, the times then when Republicans have had control of the presidency, the House of Representatives, and the Senate, so they had the ability to take care of business and get those things done, did they? No. It was just a, they were, what they were doing was called pandering to their base. All right? That's what Absalom essentially is doing. He's building a base, he's trying to pander to it, trying to win support so that way he can seize the throne. And that's ultimately what he did. But in the process, he is trashing his dad's name. What Absalom's going to learn, and what a lot of politicians learn, is when they finally get into positions of power, even if they genuinely wanted to do what they said they were going to do, now as president, they become... Uh, privy to information that they may not have had before and all of a sudden they realize oh that's why it's being done this way 
I guess maybe we can't do that. It's easy to say, well, you should be doing this when you don't have all the information and there's a good reason why that is being done. So Absalom trashing his dad's reputation. Let's uh, start looking at the passages in the packet. Proverbs 11, 19, Jenica. With his mouth and the godly person destroys his neighbor, but righteous people are rescued by knowledge. All right. With his mouth, the godless destroys his neighbor. And just think about what is it, how is it that you can destroy your neighbor with your mouth? All right. And then Proverbs 22, Brody. A good name is worth more than great wealth. Respect is more than silver and gold. Okay, so according to the italicized part there that Brody just read, what is God protecting in the Eighth Commandment? I'm going to go back to Jalen again. According to the italicized part of the passage that Brody just read, what is God protecting in the Eighth Commandment? Yeah, good name or reputation. And a good name or reputation, that is what people think of you. <coughs> Second question, why is a good reputation important? Why is it important to have a good reputation, Quinn? Because sometimes that may be all right, and why is that important? Future. What's that? Future. Okay, it, it, it can impact your future, but um, we're, we're, we're circling close to the answer. Let, let's try to get it. Why is it important, Macy, for you to have a good reputation? So you can get like, hired for like, a job and stuff. Okay. Why are they going to hire you? Because like, you have a like, good education and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Ah, trust. There's a big one right there. It determines whether or not, you know, people like us, respect us, trust us, all of those things. <clears throat> now, we can trash our own reputations by the things we say and do, but others can do that to themselves. Uh, so just to, to illustrate this point, the first point, um, there was a lady, young lady back at the time, in fact, she's uh, my age, but we're talking more back when we were 26 years old, uh, who lived uh, in the, the area where my previous congregation was in Wisconsin. And uh, she was a member at the church when I first got there, but not for very long. Because you see, at that time, she had already been married once, divorced once. Now she was married a second time, but the guy that she was living with was not her husband. <coughs> yeah, kind of... Kind of not, not a good situation. And the two children that she had at that point uh, were both fathered by men who weren't the husband, at, at least at the time when they were conceived. Um, I learned very quickly not to trust this woman. To put it bluntly, if my life absolutely depended on knowing what time it was, and she told me the time. I would rather not listen to her and instead walk outside for a half mile in minus 30 degree weather, buck naked, to go find the time than I would trust her. And I am not joking. That is how much of a chronic liar and manipulator she was. Um, it is very well believed that uh, she intentionally burnt her house down so she could collect the insurance money and build a, a better house, which eventually she and the, the guy that she was living with, who eventually became her third husband for a time, did. And then they ended up getting divorced, and the whole custody battle with their biological children became a big mess. And uh, I even got, uh, well, not directly brought into it, but served as a, um, a witness for the guardian ad litem who was trying to, figure out the, the, you know, the legal matters regarding the children. Um, this woman, she eventually tarnished her reputation so badly by the things that she de did and said. I mean, I, I figured out what she was all about uh, much sooner than the rest of the, 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 the community did uh, where I previously was. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, she tarnished her reputation in the community so bad that at one point, 
one of my uh, church members said to me, everybody in town would like to take a swing at her, and her, her dad would hold her down so you could get one shot. He'd only allow one shot, but he'd be willing to let you take one shot because that's just how bad she was as a, a, a person. Ultimately, she had to leave the whole community in the area because of uh, the damage she brought on her good name. Well, good was gone. It was just bad name uh, for her. And even to this day, I mean, and unfortunately she has no contact, as far as I can tell, with any of her biological children. I know not with her oldest daughter. Um, I, I see her daughter sometimes expressing that hurt on Facebook. Because um, uh, I, I am friends with her on Facebook. Um, young adult now, the daughter is. So, good names, reputation, very, very important. So how then, part two, do we break the Eighth Commandment? A number of quick passages there. Jalen, Leviticus 19. Alright, so the first answer here is slander. Jada, next passage, Proverbs 16. A perverse man spreads conflict, and a gossip separates intimate friends. Second one, gossip. And then Aaliyah, the third passage, Leviticus 19, 11. You shall not lie to one another. Lies. And specifically, lies about another person here. All lying is wrong, of course. But lies specifically about another person. So going on to the second page, then, uh, we're going to define those terms and what they mean. First of all, slander. Slander is a false and malicious statement or report about someone meant to damage their reputation. So a slander is a factually inaccurate statement, but it's designed to harm somebody's reputation. And then the next two, I'm going to take in conjunction with each other because there's a little bit of overlap. First of all, gossip, the sharing of personal, often private information that casts a person in a negative light. And then to betray a confidence, meaning to share what was supposed to be private. I remember um, this was... Back again during the beginning of my ministry, there was a, a man and a woman who married, got married to each other. Not a good marriage. Um, she was definitely not wife material. Um, there are a lot of things to be said about her. Uh, but just to illustrate one thing. Um, where's my guinea pig? <laughs> Paige. Let's say you get married one day. Your husband wants to buy a new car. That's a pretty expensive purchase, wouldn't you say? Brand spanking new. I'm not talking off the used car lot. Brand new car. Would you like it if he would talk with you about that first? Yeah. A big purchase like that? I mean, it's not a big deal if he goes to, the, uh, you know, goes to the store and buys some snack food, right? Whatever. A car? That's kind of an important thing. Well, yeah. Well, this woman... Um, went out and bought a brand spanking new Jeep without telling her husband. Well, how do you think he reacted? <laughs> he wasn't too happy, was he? So anyway, this illustrates just the, the, the problems in the marriage. Eventually the marriage, they, they split, got divorced, whatever. Well, sometime after that, I was at his, uh, uh, talking with his uncle. Now his uncle lived, uh, this, this guy, he never got married. He lived with his mom and dad out in the country on the farm. Um, again, never got married. Uh, they, they lived a little bit of an isolated, sheltered life. Well, when you live an isolated, sheltered life, what do you tend to talk about? People. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> Both of my classes got that answer without hesitation. You especially had no hesitation. You talk about people. Um, for better and for worse. And a lot of times for worse. And this guy started bad talking this, this crazy woman, a woman who had previously bought a Jeep, and telling me stuff about her that 
did not shed a good light on her. And I, I told him, you know, you shouldn't be telling me this. That's gossiping. He said, no, it's not. Yeah, it is. He said, no, it's not. It's true. And like, it, it doesn't matter if it's true or not. You are sharing things of a nature that I don't need to know about that is casting her name in an even worse light than it already is. That is gossip. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. If you're sharing things that are going to either A, hurt a person's reputation, or B, getting down here, and this is where this one comes in, betray a confidence, sharing things that were confidential, well, now we have a problem. It is so important to keep your mouth shut when you know something private about an individual. Do I want to have fun? Do I want to see if I can uh, get one of the girls in here to turn beet red? Oh. Mm -hmm. Why? Oh. Hmm. You know, it's, it's a bummer that Caleb isn't here because Caleb would be the perfect counterpoint to this. Oh, no. We only have two boys. Love Caleb. Let's, let, let's go with Aaliyah. <laughs> let's go with Aaliyah. Let's say that Aaliyah has a crush on Graham. Oh. All right? And she'd been thinking about this for a while, and she eventually tells her friend, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Tiffany. Tiffany, that's right. I knew it started with a T. Tells her friend Tiffany, again, welcome Tiffany, uh, about it. And Tiffany is like, oh my goodness, this is just the juiciest bit of information that I have gotten in a long time. And Tiffany goes and spreads it throughout the school. <gasps> you would do that? I wouldn't do that. Okay, you wouldn't. <coughs> I'm glad to hear that. You know, and now all the kids are, are, are like giving Ali a hard time. Maybe Graham a little bit of a hard time, too. And, you know, doing the whole Aaliyah and Graham sitting in a tree. No. So yeah. no. Yes, it is so old. It's old, but it still gets used. Yes, it does. Yeah, that's older than I am. <laughs> so, it, it, gossiping, betraying a confidence... It is embarrassing and humiliating, horribly. I mean, even to the point where uh, people have committed suicide over it. Yeah, you're like, ooh, that escalated quickly. Uh-huh. you got to be careful <clears throat> with what you say. As a pastor and as pastors here at this congregation, uh, we a lot of times are privy to some pretty embarrassing information about people. You know, they come to us and confide in us and uh, share things in confidence with us. We know a lot of things that we could do a lot of damage really quick in this congregation if we shared it with people. I have no intention of doing so, Ladesha. Uh, but my point is, it is how important it is to keep things quiet to protect that person's reputation, uh, to see to it that they are, are spared from any sort of emotional harm. And what we see here is that this isn't just about the words that we speak. Because a lot of times when you know, you're, you're sharing this information, when you're, you're slandering people, when you're telling lies about people, there's, there's a, a, something behind that that is driving that. You're not just doing that because. And that gets to the third part here. Where does false testimony come from? Uh, Ladesha, would you please read Proverbs 6? <clears throat> Feet that are to do evil, a false witness who 
All right. So some of the things here that uh, the Lord hates relate to the Eighth Commandment, right? Uh, things like lying tongue, false witness, and a person who spreads conflict between brothers. Uh, you could probably do that through like lies, half-truths, gossip, and, and so on. Um, where does God say this false testimony comes from? Look at that italicized part that I've highlighted for you. Where does this false testimony come from, Quinn? The heart. It, it is a matter of the heart. And so once again, like I said, we see that God's commandments, the Ten Commandments, are not just governing our outward actions or words, but it also governs the very attitudes and thoughts of the heart and mind. There is an evil intent there. Now, maybe not deliberately evil. Maybe not deliberately. Maybe it's laziness, you didn't think about it. Maybe you're caught up in the, the, the effort. You want to be the one to share the information. You know, it's kind of like uh, uh, the news channels. They always want to be the first one to, to have the breaking news on whatever uh, big thing is going on because, well, hey, they get the credit, they get the attention. Um, well, it's attention-seeking. It's self-seeking, self-serving. And that is where the evil intent is because you're not thinking about your neighbor first. You're thinking about yourself. It's, it's selfishness. And that gets us then into the second part here. What are some reasons or motives for spreading false testimony? Why would you do that about somebody? Yeah. For money or you don't. Okay. For attention. Attention. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what I have here for the second one. Attention seeking, that's very selfish. Any other thoughts? Jada? You need to like feel better about yourself. Yeah, there, there's my first one. A lot of times if people don't feel good about themselves, one thing that they're going to do is try to make others feel miserable along with them. <clears throat> you see this a lot with uh, kids who grow up in broken homes or with... Um, abusive parents, that their, their home life, their home setting is, is such that you know, they're, they're hurt and they're feeling bad and they end up taking it out on someone else. You know, a lot of times, you know, you're bullies in school. I, I think back to one in my grade school, he was a bully and I thought about it in my adult years and I wonder, I wonder if his his home life was not the greatest, and that's what contributed to it. I wonder if he was feeling rotten about himself, and so he wanted others to feel rotten along with him. It wasn't just me he bullied. There were others as well. So we got that one, similar to what was just said over here, maybe to make oneself look better. Though, So that's the attention, or at least related to it, to make yourself feel or look better or feel like you're better than someone else. So there's some sort of, in the third point there, there's some sort of selfish gain. And that could be even the, the money sort of aspect, what you were talking about. <clears throat> but it's really something that starts in the heart. It's not showing a heart that is loving your neighbor as yourself. It is put, um, as Scripture says, we should not think of our own interests, but uh, also, especially, first and foremost, the interests of others. And when we do this, even if we're not trying to be malicious, we're really putting our interests ahead of the others and not protecting that gift, God's gift of a good name. Because remember, that's where that gift comes from. It, it comes from God. Now, question three, if our hearts are set on hurting or harming another person's reputation, it's not just the Eighth Commandment that we're breaking anymore, is it? There's another commandment that really goes hand in hand with it. Go ahead, Ladesha. Which commandment? Fifth commandment, yeah. You shall not murder. The commandment which governs how we treat our neighbor. Uh, you know, the call to protect body and life. And we're definitely not doing that. We're, we're intentionally causing hurt or harm to the person. 
<clears throat> so this is also a fifth commandment issue. So the next question then, how do we keep the eighth commandment? Got some passages there. Proverbs 31, verses 8 and 9, Macy. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Speak for the rights of all of those who are defenseless. Speak up, judge fairly, and defend them. Oppressed, oppressed and needy. So looking at that first part there, what does God want us to do? He wants us to defend the good name of others. Defend them. And there's another a little bit of a, a lead-in to the next passage there uh, at the very beginning of Proverbs. Paige, uh, read that next one, 1 Samuel 19. After King Saul went to have David killed, Jonathan spoke bitterly about David to his father Saul. He said to him, The king should not, have, the king should not sin, sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you, and his actions have served you very well. <coughs> All right. So to speak up for, speak well of others. So that the defense, like, hey, knock it off. You only, if you see one of your friends um, giving another person crap or saying crap about another person, you tell them to knock it off. That's not right. You know, it's hard to, to confront your enemy and tell them to, to cut it out. It can be even harder doing that with one of your friends because you're always so worried about losing your friendship with that person. But to knock it off. And not only that, look what Jonathan did. David was King Saul's most loyal subject. But King Saul had very thin skin and he had a massive insecurity complex or inferiority complex about himself. And he felt that David <clears throat> was a threat to him. He was jealous of David and on multiple occasions, he actually had tried to have David killed. And Jonathan, Saul's oldest son, first in line to the throne, would actually call out his dad and say, Hey, knock it off. David has been nothing but good for you. Next passage. This one's a longer one. We've got to open our Bibles. So please go to Joshua 22, verses 9 through 31. Uh, what page is that going to be on? 22, verse 9. Uh, 323, if you have the EHV Bible, like you do. So, Brody, page 323. <clears throat> I, I want to get this whole story because I think it's a, a very interesting, fascinating story. Brody, are you good with reading that long of a section? Where? Joshua 22. Wait a minute. Yeah. Um, start at verse 9 and go all the way through to verse 31. Okay. Read nice and loud so that way the microphone can hear it too. 9? Yep. So the descendants of Reuben, the descendants of Gad, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh, Manasseh, set up to return home. They left the people of Israel in Shiloh in the land of Canaan to travel the land of Gilead. Gilead? Is it Gilead? I think so. Okay. To the land assigned to their possessions which they had acquired. They were by the word of the Lord through Moses. When they came to... <coughs> it's hard. Yeah, all right. Where you at? This one. They came to Galiloth by the Jordan, which is in the land of Canaan. The people of Reuben said, the people of Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh. Ma yeah, you're good. Just, just keep going. Built an altar there by Jordan and a conspicuously large altar. The people of Israel heard about it and said, see, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad. And the half people tribe of uh, Manasseh, I don't know, have built the altar on the frontier of the land of Canaan at Goliath, Gil Gilala, 
of the Jordan and at the side of the river that belongs to the people of Israel. When the people of Israel heard this whole community of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to go to war against them, <coughs> the people of Israel said to the priest, Time has Phineas. Phineas has, son has Eliezer. Son of Eliezer. To the people of Reuben. The people of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh. 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 There we go. And the land of Gilead. Together with them, they sent ten tribal leaders. A leader for each father's house for the tribe of Israel. Each one was ahead of his father's house according to the divisions of Israel. They came to the people of Reuben, to the people of Gad, and the half tribe of, forgot it again, Manasseh, in the land of Gilead. They spoke with them. They said, This is the whole community of the Lord. And said, Why have you committed such an unfaithful act against God of Israel by turning the Lord to death? When you when you built the, an altar for yourself, you rebelled against the Lord today. What was the sin of Peor? Baal Peor, yeah. So try trivial, something from which we have not cleansed ourselves to this day, and for which a flag came to the community of the Lord. So that today you have to turn away from the Lord. This is what will happen if you rebel against the Lord today. So okay. Uh, Aliyah, can you continue reading, please? Good job. Which Where did you leave off at? Uh, 18. <clears throat> so that today you have to turn away from the Lord. This is what will happen if you rebel against the Lord today. Tomorrow he will be furious against the whole community of Israel. But by all means, if the land you have received as your possession is unclean, cross over to the Lord's own land where the dwelling of the Lord has its home and take your possessions among us. But do not rebel against the Lord and do not make us and do not make do not make us rebels by your act of building an altar for yourself. Part from the altar of the Lord at that. And at Akin Akin Yep. Akin son of Zira Akin Akin son of Zira acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted thing <coughs> things. Did it not bring anger against the whole community of Israel? He was not the only one who perished because of his guilt. Then the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh, Manasseh. Manasseh responded to the heads of the, of the division of Israel. By God the true God, the Lord, by God the true God, the Lord, he knows in Israel who will not take. He acted in rebellion, or if he acted in unfaithfulness against the Lord, not spare us his day. He acted to build an altar for ourselves to turn from the Lord, or if we act or if we acted to make sacrifice or fellowship offerings on it, let the Lord himself demand an accounting from us. But in truth we did this because we we were concerned that in the future your children will say to your children, What connection do you have to the Lord to the God of Israel? The Lord placed a border between us and you and you people of Reuben and Gad, namely the Jordan. You have no portion in the Lord, then your children will, will stop our children from fearing the Lord. So we said, Come on now, let us build an altar, and not for burnt offer, offerings and not for sacrifice. Rather, it is to be a witness between us and you, and between our generations after us, concerning our right to perform the worship of the Lord before him by our burnt offerings, by our sacrifices, and by our fellowship offerings, so that your children can cannot say in the future to our children, you have no share in the Lord. So we said, if they say that to us and to our generations in the future, then we will say, look at the look, look at the altar of the Lord that our Father made, and not for their offering and not for sacrifice, whether it is a witness between us and them. Far be it from us to rebel against the Lord and to turn today from the Lord by building an altar for their offerings, for grain offerings, or for fellowship offerings apart from the altar of the Lord our God that is in front of this woman. Yep, through 31. Phineas. Phineas. Phineas the priest heard this, as did the tribal leaders of the community and the heads of their divisions 
of the tribes of Israel who were with him. He had heard the words of the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the people of um, Manasseh. Manasseh spoke, and they were pleased. So Phineas, son of Eliezer, Eliezer the priest, said to the people of Reuben, to the people of God, and to the people of Manasseh. Did you go past everyone yet? No? Okay. Stop after you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, all right. I know that was a very long time, but I wanted you to hear the, the history here because it really pertains to this third part. Take the words and actions of others in the kindest possible way. <clears throat> so, here's what was going on. Prior to crossing the Jordan River, the Israelite... Uh, nation had a few tribes, a tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and ha the ha half of the people of the tribe of Manasseh, they said, you know what, this land along the eastern side of Jordan looks pretty good. We want to make that our home. <clears throat> God said, okay, yeah, you can do that. However, uh, before you can fully settle in it, your men have to cross over and help the men of the rest of Israel fight for and clear out the Canaanites in there. Uh, Canaanites, by the way, horribly wicked, um, immoral people. I mean, they routinely practice things like infant sacrifice and whatnot. So uh, they, they were really bad. Once they cleared it out, then they could return home. Well, now we're seven years later. That military campaign has come to an end. Those two and a half tribes are going to go back over the Jordan River and establish their homes. But as they, before they cross the Jordan River, they make this really big honking altar. <clears throat> Word gets out to the other tribes about this altar, and there's an instant panic among them. And they're filled with anger because God had said, the only place you can worship and offer sacrifices is at the tabernacle. And this altar was definitely not at the tabernacle. And so all of a sudden, they're ready to go to war with these other tribes over this whole matter. Again, that escalated quickly. Do you think they could have done things a little bit differently before saying, we're going to go to war? What, 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 what did they do, these other tribes? What sin did they commit against Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. <clears throat> they did not take the words and actions of others in the kindest possible way. In other words, they did not first go to fight. Now, thankfully, eventually they did, and cooler heads prevailed. But initially, they got all up in arms, literally, about this, without ever going to ask them, why did you do this? I mean, did they have a right to be suspicious? Like, what's going on here? Yeah, because what do you use an altar for? You use it for burning, offering sacrifices. So they got a right to be suspicious, but did they honestly know what the intent of that altar was, Paige? No, no they didn't. And when they did go and find out, did, was it going to be used for offerings? No. Instead, it was going to serve like as a memorial a physical marker for the people living on the west side of the Jordan to say, hey, don't forget us folk who live on the east side of the Jordan are still Israelites. You can't say that this natural boundary, which sometimes becomes impassable because of the floodwaters that come down from Mount Hermon and whatnot in the spring, will naturally separate them for a time. In fact, that separation was so much that over time they started developing different dialects and would say words differently. One would say Sibboleth, the other side would say Shibboleth. Uh, <clears throat> and so if you ever hear a, a Shibboleth or a Sibboleth test, um, it has to do with that. And so it was, there were good intentions with this altar, but they automatically assumed the worst of it. Put yourself into these shoes. Sometimes you do something and you have good intentions for doing it. And yet somebody will come up to you all ticked off 
and say, why did you do this, right? You've had, you've had people misunderstand you before, right, Macy? How do you feel about that? That's not fair, right? They assumed the worst in you. You don't like that. Brody, how do you like that when people assume the worst in you when you didn't have any mean intentions? No, I hate That's not right. And yet we do this so often to people. We don't like it when it happens to ourselves, but we do it to others. Unless you know beyond a shred of a doubt what another person's intentions are, and unless you've spoken with them, you probably don't, give them the benefit of the doubt. Even if you can't see any possible um, good purpose for what this person is doing, be patient and wait. You know, I've had people come to me about, oh, so-and-so is doing this. And I said, well, hold on, let's wait. And they get all upset at me that I'm not ready to jump on the bandwagon with them and, you know, come down on this individual. Like, what are you doing? I'm like, hold on. Slow down a bit. Let's go talk to that person. And then when we do, we find out, oh, there actually is a good reason because we didn't know all the information. We didn't have it all. And now it makes sense. This is such an important part about Luther's explanation of the Eighth Commandment, that last part. But take the words and actions of others in the kindest possible way. Now getting back to these first two, defend the good name of others and speak well of others, we're going to watch two videos here. The first video, we're going to really see the, uh, the, the defending aspect shining through. Now, mind you, um, at a couple of points in here, there is some um, colorful language, shall we say. My apologies for that. Um, it, it happens, but at the same time, you might understand the reason why it happens as we watch. So let's watch the video. Produce an I of one. I never had anything else. For people with special needs. And have a nice day. Career opportunities have grown dramatically. He's a cutie. But what would you do if you saw this young grocery bagger? Can you not understand me? Being treated like this. You're absolutely retarded, dude. You have to go faster. As you may have guessed, Josh Heber is not just a grocery bagger, he's also an actor who's appeared in everything from Sesame Street. Tell Mary how to blow like a soft breeze, okay? Oh, that's good. Hey, Mr. Wilder. To Hollywood movies. Hey, Hardy. How you doing? Doing good. Now he's working for us. They shouldn't hire these people, right? And so is this actress. With our hidden cameras in place in this grocery store in Brooklyn, New York, we wonder, what will customers do when confronted with this kind of Absolutely intolerance? Hard, you have to go faster. This woman is shocked, but will she stand up for Josh? They shouldn't hire these people, right? Mm, I don't know. I think more or less try to help them out, you know? Their reactions are slow, you know what I mean? Right, I know what you're saying. She backs down. Why didn't you tell her? Why didn't you confront her, get in her face? Well, I just didn't want to get involved too much with that. I mean, she can lash out at me in any kind of way, and, and that's what I'm trying to avoid. Back at the checkout counter, Josh is doing a fine job bagging, and yet... I hope this, goes, this line goes fast, though, because, you know... How will this customer respond to a whispered criticism? But they take forever. She seems to agree. It takes a lot of, out of our day to wait for them to be to do what they're going to do. I mean, we could have already had lunch. This is ridiculous. She later told us she didn't like how Josh was treated, but she doesn't regret her silence. I feel it wasn't my right to say anything to her, because, you know, some people, they just have to let off steam. When we're silent, our silence condones the language. Madeline Will is with the National Down Syndrome Society. It's important to say again and again, this is wrong. This is not fair. This is not how we treat other people. I had to pick the retard one, right? But experts say slurs like these are used all too often. You're going to have to double this. Have you heard of doubling? We wonder. Can you believe they hire these people? Will anyone fight for Josh? And then along comes this woman. Oh, no. I didn't see this was a part of mine. The what? What time did mine? 
Did you just say that? I can't believe you just said that. Right? Aren't you? Can you just speed it up a little bit you know, more, something, please? There's something dreadfully wrong with you. You with want me? to be on the uh, yeah, with you. How could you say that? If that was my child, I'd deck you. We introduce ourselves to Linda Tapia. You got angry. Oh, I was really angry. I don't treat people like that, ever. It's heartbreaking. It's just heartbreaking to see people do that. Heartbreaking enough just to hear this. But imagine if you're Josh. Yeah. It's not right to treat people like us who has Down syndrome like that. So to her, you would say, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. Retard, yo. You're so stupid. But the abuse continues. Look how fast I do it. Look. See? Just like that. This time with teenaged actors. Will the reaction be any different? This retarded kid can't do anything. That's not nice. He's an idiot. Watch this woman. She sends a silent message of support to Josh. Come on, really? Should they let this guy work here? He's got rights to He's somebody's child. You're somebody's child, aren't you? And from way back there, this man comes up and steps right in. I mean, seriously, who gave this guy a job? Hey, get out of here, man. What are you doing making fun of this guy? Get out of the store. You got to kick this guy out of the store right now. Are you even selling this stuff? Yeah, get out of the store. You're an ass. Get out of here. You should be ashamed of yourself. He circles around the checkout line to comfort Josh. Don't worry about this guy, man. You doing okay? You doing a good job? Yeah, thanks, man. It turns out Kevin Lynn knows all too well how painful this can be. That guy really made me mad. He has a sister with Down syndrome. I've heard people like that Tell say, your sister this. Yeah, say stuff like that to my sister and, and degrade her in that way. And I mean, it's crazy, you know. She can do so many of the same things that everybody else can. The cruelty continues. Can you go any slower? And this man just keeps his head down. But little do we know, we're about to get a piece of this woman's mind. Just look at him. Are you kidding? Because if you're not kidding, I'm getting ready to punch you out. Hurry up. Stupid, Why don't you man. just shove the stuff up your ass and get out? Time to introduce ourselves. But Shelly Kay thinks I'm the store manager. Hi, ma'am. How are you? Hi. Are you okay? There was a customer here who was abusing him. I want you to know he was something. making fun of him. He was criticizing him. He was cursing at him. That's when we tell her about our what would you do experiment. So you weren't afraid that he might turn on you? When I get that angry, when it has to do with injustice, I really don't care. If I got punched out, I got punched out. It just doesn't matter. But while most customers had no problem standing up to the teenagers... Come on, retard, let's go. Will they be so fearless with this intimidating actor? It's gonna take you a while. We got a retard working. This man stays quiet. Put the eggs in separate bags. Thank you. And watch this man's expression. He says a few words on his way out. I think you need to chill out, bro. But while the men mostly stand down... You believe this? No, I think you are disgusting. The women stand up. Angela Gamone says it's not Josh who has the problem. It's the man abusing him. Some people you can see the disabilities, some people you can't. It's usually the ones you can't that have the bigger disability. We filmed for two long days, 30 different scenarios, and no one responded with more eloquence than this woman. How would you feel if that was your son or your daughter? How would you feel if that was you? He's a person, the same as you and I, with feelings. Yeah, but they have places for retarded people, thank you. Yeah, and they should have places for people like you that are rude and insensitive and cruel. And when it's time for you to meet your maker, I hope he remembers how you work. Her name is Karen, and she's taught children with special needs. I'm a school teacher. Everybody deserves an education, everybody deserves a job, and everybody deserves a chance in this life. And you should be ashamed of yourself. By the time I step in, Karen is shaken. You got in his face. I do care, although I'm not usually like that, but I'm just so insensitive and, and I just couldn't believe it. And there's one more reason Karen is so deeply moved. Meet Elvis. He does an amazing job here and he's a hard worker and he's a great person. He really does work at the store and also has special needs. The store's owners. What kind of employee is Elvis? He's the best. I see him in action all the time, and, you know, he's always busy. He's a busy guy. And yet customers often abuse Elvis, using the same cruel words used in our experiment. How does that make you feel? Sir, I 
Why do you think they do that? Uh, no, no. I apologize to you for them, and I think that's disgraceful. And you're a wonderful person and a human being. Uh, yeah. And despite all the abuse, Josh, our actor, is proud of his role here. Proud of the message. People like me and Elvis could need more proudness, more love, more caring, because we care about our people. No one puts us down. No one. Winston Churchill once said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. See what it means to defend others? Yeah. Speaking up for them. Now we're going to watch another video. This one comes down a little bit more to your level. I believe this actually took place in Mankato. Uh, it's several years old now. But a uh, rather interesting video uh, regarding some students at a school. I pledge allegiance to the flag. All the students at Franklin Elementary start every day with a pledge. Indivisible. But the justice for all part belongs to five fifth grade boys. Why pick on someone who needs, has special needs? Yeah. They're talking about James Wilmer. Hi. Is who learns a little differently was than most of the other fifth graders. Coins. They're like using them. Which, it turns out, and taking advantage of them. Can get a guy teased. Coins. Because he's easier to pick on and it's just not right. Which is why Gus, Tyler, Landon, Jake, and Jack <laughs> decided this year to have James's back. It really kind of makes you proud to be their teacher. Mallory Hauk says the school's anti-bullying lessons must have struck a chord. Landon. But this has gone beyond even her expectations. Thank you. James's mom's, too. He used to not want to go out for recess or anything. It would be like a struggle. Hike. And now he can barely eat his lunch to get outside to play with those guys. <laughs> play and learn. He has a notebook with over oh. 600 teams of college. Gustavus Adolphus. That's how much he likes sports. Nebraska. They learned, too, that James was adopted from an orphanage in Columbia, and that six years later, he lost his new father in a bicycle accident. And we just got a basketball hoop last week because he now loves basketball. I mean, they're changing him. And they're still not done. We're like, do you have any sports games? He's like, and he was like, no, I don't have any video game systems. So that's when I came up with the idea. With some of their own money and some from their parents, the boys recently delivered to James video games and a new PlayStation. Every one of them was smiling like crazy. The first time friends had ever come to play with James. I'll never forget it. Never. Jack, what? You tie my shoe. Yep. In. Divisible. <laughs> He's an awesome kid to hang out with. You're too fast! <laughs> MVP! MVP! Boom! Touchdown! Woo! All of these guys are, are the best friends anybody could ask for. No Franklin fifth grade friends have ever pledged allegiance like the James gang. It's my 12th touchdown. All of you guys. Pretty cool support, wouldn't you say, Brody? And those are all the kind of guys, you know, that you can see being the, uh, the cool guys, the popular guys, whatever you want to talk about, however you want to term it, uh, the athletic guys. And they're there to help support the one who is not in a position to stand up for and defend himself. Be like those boys. That's an awesome thing. All right, part five. Um, well, before we get to part five, there's a few things that we want, I, we need to go through, and we're going to start going through things quickly here because i got to preach in a little bit. So to help defend the good name and speak well of others, here are three pieces of practical advice. Number one, focus on the good things about people. <clears throat> Focus on the good things. Try to find something good about somebody. 
Second of all, you know, tell people not to gossip or say bad things. <clears throat> and third, speak positively about people, especially when someone is saying something bad about them. So Martin Luther once said that we should take words and actions in the kindest possible way, a point that I really emphasized earlier. What can we do to help ourselves follow this godly advice? A couple of things. First of all, don't assume that people always have bad motives. And look for other possible explanations for what they said or did. Again, a lot of times there might be something that you're not thinking about or you're not considering. And, but if you think about it a little bit, oh, maybe they did that for that reason. Now, obviously, if they did something wrong, you, get, you, you, <laughs> you, you can't polish a turd. It's still a turd. If it's wrong, it's wrong. But there might be, you know, you, there are some things that are in that, those gray areas where we're not sure, you know, was this wrong or bad or not? <clears throat> so, some good advice on human relationships to keep in mind. Getting into part five, how do we deal with the sin of our neighbor? Sometimes we break the Eighth Commandment because we're angry with a person when they sin against us. To help mitigate this angry response, Scripture gives us some valuable reminders and a proper course of action. Uh, Quinn, please read Matthew 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his sin just between, just between the two. If he listens to you, you have regained your brother. All right, so according to the italicized portion here, what does Jesus tell us to do when someone sins against us? The answer, of course, is... To show him his fault, but notice the word privately. And I emphasize that. Privately show him his fault. Just between the two of you. All right? And that implies something. What is he not telling us to do? He's not telling us to blab it around like, hey, so-and-so did this to me. Because now you are just looking to, to hurt or harm that person's reputation. There is maybe one caveat to this. All right, one exception. Um, generally, you want to keep the matter in between the two of you. If, you know, uh, Jalen has offended me or I have offended her, what should happen first is we go to that person individually and try to handle it between the two of us. Sometimes, however, because of the complexities of human relationships, uh, maybe things aren't good between me and Jalen to begin with. And there is some sort of impasse already there, and I can't broach it. What I might end up doing is going to somebody who knows Jalen a little bit more and saying, hey, can I talk with you? So this is what happened. But it's not in, with the purpose of tearing Jalen's name down. It's a, with the purpose of trying to work things out and restore uh, the relationship. Like, can you help me? How do, I, how do you think I should address this with her? <coughs> There's a different intent going on there. Now, mind you, Scripture does say that if a person, if Jenica's sin against me is public, meaning that... Uh, the church generally knows about it, all right? And it's a, a pretty serious, egregious one that I do have the right to uh, go to her and talk to her publicly about it uh, that, so that others know. So that way people are taking notice and uh, realizing, okay, that's not something that is permitted or tolerated in the church. Question number three, what does Jesus mean by Show him his sin. If a person sins against you, go and show him his sin. What does that mean? To tell him what he did wrong. All right, yeah. Explain what he did wrong. And why might we need to do that? Finish. Yep, follow it up. 
Because they might not realize what they did. Or yeah. They might not even be aware of it. Like, oh, I didn't realize that I did that. Graham, when you're done writing uh, these two here, please read our next passage, Luke 17, verse 3. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm making you guys write a whole bunch down right away, but unfortunately, tick-tock, tick-tock. i got to be over there before 7 because I preach. You got it, Graham? Yep. Luke 17, verse 3. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. So, question four. According to that double underlined portion, if the sinner or person listens and repents, what are we to do next? Forgive. Him. Forgive. Yep. And what does that mean to forgive somebody? Forgive him. Huh? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Does it literally mean forget? You know, you've heard the expression forgive and forget. Yeah, no. no, I'll be even mentioning that if you're in church tonight, most likely, that God did not build into our brains a delete button where we can just, you know, erase the memory at will. All right? Forgive does not necessarily mean forget, but when we say forget, there is an element of truth to that. What it means is that we don't hold the sin against that person anymore. We're not going to continue holding it over their head. That's what it means to forgive. <clears throat> now let's take a look at the next two passages. Jenica, John 3.16. And Brody, right when she's done, read Hebrews 2. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Certainly, it will. It was fitting for God, for the, the one for whom and through whom everything exists, and leading many sons to glory, bring the, the author for their salvation to his goal, who suffers, who, who sanctifies, and those who are being sanctified all have one Father. For that reason, he is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers. Within the congregation, I will sing your praise. Okay. So question five then, uh, looking at the double underlined and red portions of the passages, what can we remember about how God views another person that will help us to keep the Eighth Commandment? The first answer is, Jesus died for them. Just as he died for us. And if Jesus died for them, that means God loves all people. If God loves all people, we should too. <clears throat> and here's a, a really interesting case coming out of the Hebrews passage that Brody just read. That in the case of Christians, it says, Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brothers. He uses the term brothers, not sisters, because of the, the whole picture of the inheritance. Remember in the Old Testament times, the inheritance was passed on to the sons. And so the implication there that uh, those, those people are those who will inherit eternal life in heaven. But he's not ashamed of them. So, yeah, you might have a beef against them. They might have done something uh, embarrassing uh, to uh, that that embarrasses themselves and their reputation, might embarrass you too. But don't forget, Jesus is not embarrassed of them. Just as he's not embarrassed of you. He's not ashamed to call them brothers. You know, there are no uh, black sheep in his family. <clears throat> Maybe you've heard that expression before. Oh, they're, they're the black sheep of the family. You know, maybe the oddball or the one who's kind of cast out, not really involved in the family. There's no such thing in God's house. And 
Not just that he's not ashamed, but notice this other part, that he's singing their praises. I think that's a beautiful picture for us to think about how Jesus views us personally, but then also a good reminder about how he views uh, the other people in the Christian faith. Question number six, then, how can God's forgiveness help us keep the Eighth Commandment? The Eighth Commandment starts a lot of times with anger, frustration. Maybe somebody did something against us. We want to get even. And we want, how we want to get even is by hurting or harming their reputation somehow, embarrassing them. How is remembering God's forgiveness going to help us? Are we going to get to the point where we want to take revenge if we've already forgiven them? No. So bear this thought in mind. God has forgiven our sins. All right? And if he's done that, he's also enabling us to forgive the sins of others. And the result is we're not going to take it to the next level and look to get even by trashing their name. Okay. So the last part here, the eighth commandment in my life. How does God or the eighth commandment serve as a mirror or the second use of the law for us? How does it show us our sins? Well, it does that uh, by this: that we often that we hurt people's reputations by what we say or don't say, and often we do not take people's words and actions in the kindest possible way. Basically, it shows us all those different ways that we heard about earlier that we've broken this commandment. And one, one practical thing to keep in mind, if you are in the habit of slandering people or gossiping about people or spreading lies about people, you're not only hurting their reputation, you're hurting yourself, your own reputation. Because you're going to get a reputation as a person who does those things. And you're going to lose friends over it. Or at the very least, you know, there, there's one lady I know back in Wisconsin. Uh, she has quite the reputation for sharing things that shouldn't be shared. And so everybody around her has learned very well. We're not going to share those sorts of things until we're all right with everybody already knowing it. Because have you ever heard the expression, loose lips sink ships? They really do. <clears throat> Give people a couple more moments here. Okay. In Jesus, we see one who respected the reputation of others. <coughs> How do his active and his passive obedience give us hope? Same question that we've been having throughout all these commandments. He kept that eighth commandment, and then he died for our sins. The short answer right there. And this is a really cool thing. You know, not only has he given us the gift of a good name or reputation, but in the waters of baptism, he blessed us with the best name. Remember that. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When we were adopted into God's family as his children through those waters, we received that name of God. Brought into his family. And that is a good name to have. <clears throat> Sorry for the hand cramp. All right, to wrap things up really quickly, 
You've got the uh, chart there. God's gift of a good name. So defending others, speak well, speak up for those who can't speak for themselves and take the words and actions of others in the kindest possible way. Don't lie, slander, gossip, betray confidence, those sorts of things. Ultimately all revolving around God's gift of a good name. Uh, really quick, any questions at all? All right, let's close with the blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and remain with us all. Amen. Have a good night.